deaf people in the workhouses. Entering the workhouse. Patterns. Popular misconceptions of the workhouse lead some to view it as almost a carceral site in which paupers were all but imprisoned. According to the popular stereotype, workhouse inmates were helpless victims, powerless to do anything to alleviate their fate in these most oppressive places. Yet a closer study of workhouse inmates shows us that individuals entered and departed from these institutions according to their own needs and circumstances. Deaf people were no different. Admission patterns of deaf people into the workhouses could vary hugely, as they did with the rest of the population. They could spend inordinately long periods of time in the workhouse. However, lengthy stays were not the only pattern of admission observed among deaf paupers. Others entered for short stays. and did so repeatedly over time. So, deaf paupers, just like others, could utilise the workhouse, not out of desperation, but rather in a strategic way. In times of need, for when work was unavailable, for dealing with unwanted pregnancies or for medical care. Communication. What set the deaf workhouse experience apart from that of other paupers? was communication. Communication was, of course, central for the purposes of enforcing workhouse discipline and for management of paupers within the workhouse walls. For a deaf and dumb pauper, communication could be unclear ineffective and may have served to render their experience even more oppressive and harsh than otherwise. The method of communication most often used by deaf paupers was some form of signed language. We have many examples from newspaper reports of deaf and dumb paupers using signs to communicate. However, if we seek to know the truth about what a deaf pauper meant by their signs, a historiographical and methodological issue arises. To a large extent, even our most detailed descriptions of signs and gestures of deaf paupers depend on the descriptive powers of the journalists, guardians and workhouse staff that describe them. The documentary evidence we have in this regard is written by hearing people who are not fluent or expert in sign languages or in deaf people's use of gesture. A remarkable amount of suppositions are made in these sources as to what a deaf person's gestures and signs, however confidently described by these observers, actually mean. We must accept that this entails never truly knowing which sign or gesture was used, nor exactly what it meant in that context. Admission. Admission to the workhouse and the interviewing of potential entrants 
posed obvious issues for deaf people. Paupers would routinely be questioned by guardians to establish their background and to determine which electoral division they were to be charged to. Evidence given during hearings of the Select Committee on Law of Rating Ireland in 1871 points to difficulties in communication. Many of those people being questioned are a little elderly and some of them a little hard of hearing. When they are called upon by a set of gentlemen sitting all round a table to give a history of their lives for the last three years. An uneducated and especially a deaf person is apt to be puzzled. Deaf people seeking entry to the workhouse could successfully utilise gestures, signing or writing to gain admission. However, communication with uneducated deaf and dumb people could at times be difficult or even impossible. An elderly deaf mute woman found wandering about the streets of Belfast in 1904. Was brought to Francis McGinn, missioner of the Mission Hall for the Deaf and Dumb and also a deaf man by the Belfast Workhouse authorities, in hopes that McGinn as an expert in the finger language, might be able to discover her name and address. McGinn reported that as she had never been to school, it was impossible to converse with her, save in the rudest of gestures. Regulation and Discipline Sound and speech were part of the infrastructure regulating the lives and movements of paupers. Deaf inmates, therefore, were placed at an immediate disadvantage. An examination of the workhouse regulations reveals a number of aspects of life within its walls that would militate against people who did not hear. It is unclear whether such regulations would have been dispensed with for able-bodied deaf paupers or whether the definition in the articles were considered to exempt people who could not hear. A major hurdle was knowing the workhouse rules. In theory, inmates could access these rules in a written form. Workhouse rules stated that the master shall cause a legible copy of the regulations respecting disorderly and refractory paupers contained in this order to be kept suspended in the dining hall of the workhouse in the schoolroom or schoolrooms, and in the probationary wards. Educated deaf inmates were covered by this provision, though the formal language used may have caused further confusion on the finer details of the rules. However, for most of the 19th century, literacy among deaf people was the exception and not the rule. Hearing paupers, even if non-literate, may have had the rules verbally explained to them once. Uneducated deaf and dumb people could not and were at a serious disadvantage as to how to manage 
without finding themselves unwittingly engaging in disorderly or refractory behaviour. Another rule stated that who shall make any noise when silence is ordered to be kept shall be deemed disorderly. This opened up numerous potential situations where deaf inmates, largely unaware of how much noise they are making, through no fault of their own, could be subject to disciplinary action. Female paupers could be vulnerable to abuse and exploitation in the workhouse. And even when they made complaints about their treatment, few of these charges were sustained. Essentially then, the master and other male functionaries could indulge in various violent and degrading acts for their own gratification. This same danger affected female deaf inmates, several of whom appeared to become pregnant by workhouse staff in this period. Such abuse of position was of course by no means restricted to deaf people but the difference came in the much lower potential for deaf women to have their side of the story heard at all. As we have seen, life at the workhouse was quite harsh for the general population. But several factors, the most important one being that of communication, made lives doubly difficult for deaf people who were inmates. Yet, paradoxically, the workouts helped them out in times of need. <laughs>